Well, hello, I'm Dave Wilhelm, president of GSM, the Geological Society of Minnesota. Welcome to the last lecture of 2020. Thanks for being part of a tradition that goes back 82 years to 1938. Um, this lecture's topic is the Glacial History of Iowa by Philip Kerr, a geologist with the Iowa Geological Survey. Um, this will be a chance for us to visit our neighbor to the south. I'll introduce him shortly. Um, as uh, regular members know, we're going to have a few announcements, and we're going to have Phil's one-hour lecture, and we'll have Q&A. Um, all participants other than the host and presenter and moderators are muted for most lectures, including this one. Randy Strobel is the host, and he and I are moderators. Um, as always, Randy, thanks for setting up these Zoom webinars. Um, the Zoom platform offers a number of means of interaction that we should use. Um, we we'll like to handle most questions at the end. Uh, you can enter a question anytime during the lecture. Just click the Q&A icon and type in your question. You don't need to wait till the end to enter it. But we're going to wait till the end to actually read them and answer them. Um, and for those few persons joining by phone, um, assuming we don't forget to do this, we will unmute you in case you have questions you want to ask verbally. Um, we might also unmute other questioners if they need to clarify their question. Um, if you have a quick question for which you'd like an immediate answer, you can click the raise hand icon and enter the question. Uh, for these, the, we moderators will use our judgment without interrupting the presenter during the presentation. You can also use raise hand to uh, report any technical issues. And there's also a chat option that uh, you can use. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, a couple of uses we have for chat in a minute. Um, most of these GSM webinars, including this one, are recorded and uh, are available online. We will send members and all the other participants an email with the link when each recording becomes available. For the full lecture schedule, the full lecture schedule is on our website. Uh, thanks to Steve Erickson for arranging another outstanding slate of topics and presenters. Our next webinar is scheduled for February 1st, 2021. So about six weeks from now. Um, we have a long holiday break before we meet again. Um, so currently we don't have a topic or lecture assigned for that seminar, but Steve's working on finding one. Um, you will be updated by email and on the website when we know more about uh, February 1st. And in the event we cannot find a lecture for that week, our next lecture will be February 15th, and we do have one scheduled for that. But uh, Dave, yeah. Dave, can I crash for a second? Dave? You certainly can. We, we do have we do have a, a speaker. I don't, I've forgotten his name, but it's going to be about the uh, Great Lakes area, the formation of the Great Lakes. It's a speaker from uh, Lake Superior State, if I remember right, or Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, uh, Lake Superior area. Uh, okay. So we do have a speaker. I don't have the name right in front of me, so we'll... Uh, I'll give that, okay. give well, that information. We should get that uh, information on the website in a day or two, depending on. Uh, so, everybody no, check, check the Breckenridge. website in a couple of days. Andy Breckenridge is the speaker. Oh, Andy. Yeah. Andy's a good guy. Okay. Philip knows him, obviously. <laughs> um, and also, this webinar is all GSM webinars copyrighted by the author. Uh, we kindly ask that you respect this copyright, but not forwarding the Zoom link nor recording the lecture yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, as with all our live lectures, this lecture is free and open to the public, not just GSM members. If you are not a GSM member, uh, please open the chat box and type none member in your city and state, province, or country. Um, also mention how you found, about it, uh, found out about us. So we like to see how many none members attend so we can see how well our information reaches the general public. So please do this, even though I know you've had to register for the uh, uh, for this to get the link, but it, we do appreciate you put that in the chat box. Um, and of course, we'd love for any non-members to consider joining our organization. Um, not required, but the membership information and forms are on our website. Um, and also, we can count the number of devices that tune in, but not the number of people watching from each device. So we get a better count of those participating. If you're watching with at least one other person, type two persons or whatever your number is in the chat box. Then we can, uh, we'll add that to the count of devices so we know how many actual people are watching. Uh, continuing education credits. These lectures are eligible for one hour, one hour of CE credits. 
if that's something you can use, uh, use chat to request a form, um, include your name and email address. Um, if you don't want everybody to see this information, there's a chat option that allows only the moderators to see what you type. Um, if you do that following the meeting, I will fill out a form, sign it, and email it to you. Um, and one other thing, I hope you find the, the links to the various geological and other scientific resources that I send out useful. I plan to continue doing that, um, but keep the suggestions coming, um, especially as the long holiday break will start in two weeks since so hopefully I can send you links to recordings and stuff because there's not gonna be very little live stuff. Um, if there's any other announcements, do a raise hand. Um, otherwise, this is my last lecture as GSM president after three years of serving you. Um, so I'm gonna be leaving the board after, uh, after December 31st. Uh, rest assured, I'll remain active in GSM, including continuing as field trip coordinator. Um, and hopefully we can have, a, we can be more active with field trips in 2021 than we were this year. Although we did have a great field trip that Kate did, but only one. Um, at our November board meeting, uh, as you already know, we selected Joe Newberg as the new GSM president. His term begins January 1st. Joe has been active in GSM for some years including board membership for the last three. So I'm confident our organization will continue with great leadership. Joe would like to introduce himself to you. So I'll let him speak for a few minutes before I introduce Phil. Thanks, Dave. Greetings. I just wanted to take a moment to tell all you Geology Society members how honored I am to be serving as your president for the coming year. Big shoes to fill, but I look forward to working with the board and the committee chairs to keep GSM humming along. Thanks, enjoy the talk this evening. Happy holidays to you all. See you next year. Thanks, Joe. And I look forward to uh, not being president for this next year because it'll, uh, uh, it'll be, it'll be uh, nice to uh, take a little more, less active role. But I have enjoyed doing it for three years. So Phil Kerr is a, a court, I'm pronouncing it, quartner, quartinery, yeah, Quaternary. Quaternary. Quaternary, I knew that, okay. Geologist for the Iowa Geological Survey. Uh, he attended the University of Iowa for his BS and MS degrees in geoscience. His master's thesis worked on the timing and distribution of a middle Wisconsin ice advance into Iowa that came through Minnesota. Um, being born in the center of the state, he has taken a deep interest in understanding the sequence of glacial events that led to Iowa's reworked landscape. Welcome, Phil. We look forward to hearing what happened to the glaciers after they passed through Minnesota. <laughs> all right, well, thank you for having me. I'm glad uh, that you all have uh, an interest in quaternary geology, because you know the great thing about this form of geology is it's basically the modern landscape. So once you start to understand how the ice behaved, you can really put together what is going on. And uh, especially in Iowa and Minnesota, since we're dominated by the advance of, of uh, the quaternary ice sheets. So I'm gonna uh, share my presentation here. It's a little long, but you know, I, I usually tend to just really fly through these slides. So don't be intimidated by the 93 down there in the bottom corner. All right, let's share that and get to it. Flip that around. There we go. All right. So this is the glacial history of Iowa and kind of the glacial history of Minnesota, but a little compressed because, well, we don't have as many different till sheets as Minnesota does. And that's one thing I really respect about the Minnesota survey is that they break down ice advances from all over the place. But in Iowa, as you'll learn, we don't have as much complexity. Not to say it's not as good, just not as complex. So I don't know the expertise or the level of knowledge for uh, most of the viewers here, but just a basic summary of what the quaternary, uh, what the quaternary is, it's, it's the last 2.6 million years. So basically the start of North America's ice uh, 
uh, being covered by ice. And geology is a study of time and materials. And that's something I always go back to. It's very part of the fundamental uh, uh, part of the study. And so this, this time period, this, this uh, quaternary is dominated by the response of the world to the North American ice sheet. And then the materials that are brought down by the ice sheets really shape the landscape around us. And the good thing about Iowa is that it is not covered by the last ice advance. So Minnesota was almost completely covered by what's called the Wisconsin, that's the last glacial stage. And that only dipped down in about the center third of the state. So other than that, there's uh, older till sheets right at the surface. And so that would allow us to uh, delve into those older advances to get to how the Laurentide ice sheet, the North American ice sheet behaves since the start of the Quaternary. So I make maps for a living. What, that's what I do for um, most of the part of my job working for the state survey. I make maps for the USGS state map program. So I like to just look at the area in which I'm working. And here's what it looks like without uh, modern boundaries on it. You know, these political boundaries are all human conceptions. But what we should really look at is the landscape itself. And you can really see, you know, how this area looks smeared. And then it comes down into this uh, lower region here. And then you have this big river here with about 30 uh, mile wide uh, valley in it. And then this um, older river here that has more drainages coming off of it. And so this is the Missouri River to the west and the Mississippi to the east. And here you can see the little snout of Iowa, if you want to call it that. But you can see that there's a different flavor from ice that comes from this direction, from the northwest, and then ice that comes in from Lake Superior. So you might hear the formation of the Great Lakes. I'll spoil it a little bit in this talk, but I won't give out the full or divulge the full reason for it. So hopefully Andy can give you some, some interesting tidbits. But one of the big controls is where ice comes from, and that has changed over the quaternary. So if you zoom in a little bit closer to Iowa, you can see there's a lot, actually a lot going on. So people will often say, oh, Iowa's so flat, and they're incorrect. They're actually thinking about Illinois, which is completely flat because it was glaciated uh, during the Illinoisan, the penultimate glacial stage, and the Wisconsin. So that is buzz down, super flat, landscape hasn't developed yet. But in Iowa, we have what are called landform regions. And these are areas around the state that have similar um, topographic features, ages, and uh, landforms. So the oldest is the Southern Iowa Drift Plain. And that was last glaciated maybe half a million years ago. And then the Iowa, uh, the Paleozoic Plateau, which is similar to the Driftless region of Wisconsin, but this has till in it. There's, there's actually erratics, evidence for glacial advances. So we can't call it driftless, but it's unique because of uh, how the landscape interacts with the Mississippi River. And so it's dominated by bedrock uh, uh, influenced landforms, really uh, tall ridges. It's called Little Switzerland, uh, which would imply that there's a big Switzerland out here are out there, but you know, I, I don't think that's as flattering as little Switzerland. And then you have the Northwest Iowa Plains, which is a flat area dominated by uh, thin cover of loss and the iron surface, which I won't get to because it's uh, a land of madness and, and confusion. And then you have the Lus Hills, which are one of the thickest deposits of uh, Lus in the world accumulated over the last uh, glacial stage. So it's a really peculiar thing because there's so much windblown sediment here right along the Missouri River. And places like China have a lot of LUS, but it's accumulated over the last 3 million years. Whereas this, uh, these LUS hills, uh, there's been you know, dozens of, of meters of accumulation since um, the last glacial advance. So you know, I don't know exactly the, the breakdown, but it's always good to, uh, or the, the expertise, but it's always good to go back to the basics. And one of the most basic questions for a quaternary geologist is what is a glacier? And then there's two different, two different uh, uh, things to keep in mind here. The biggest one is that in order to be considered a glacier, 
it has to be ice that moves due to internal deformation. And what that means is it grow, grow, the ice will grow so large that it will start to deform, kind of like if you set silly putty on a table, the putty will uh, flow due to its weight. And that's what has to happen in order for it uh, a body of ice to be considered a glacier. If it doesn't move, if it's just sitting there, well, then it's then it's not a glacier, it's an ice field. So um, the other way to get it to move though, is you have to have accumulation of snow year after year. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind because a lot of people think, oh, well, glaciers form when the winters are really, really cold. That's not exactly true. What actually needs to take place is you have to have that snow last over the summertime. So it's not cold winters, it's cool summers that allow these ice sheets to grow. There's two types of glaciation, two types of glaciers too. You have the traditional alpine ones. So named after, I believe these, there's this uh, mountain range in Europe called the Alps. I've, I've heard about it, uh, but they're more mountain glaciers. So they're controlled by topography. Whereas continental ones like the Laurentide, the North American ice sheet, are so large that they will completely cover anything that's in place. So with those in mind, let's go a little bit uh, more into how these glaciers form. So you might be looking out your window and seeing all this fluffy snow and think, well, how does that form ice? Well, you know, just like anything, you apply a lot of it and it starts to, to build up. So you start with these nice fluffy snowflakes and then over years and decades and centuries in some places, you'll start to accumulate uh, more material and it will compress. And what that does is it starts to squeeze out all those air pockets and then that increases the, the, the density of, of, this, uh, of the snow, turning it from snow to granular ice to fern and then to actual glacial ice. And this glacial ice, you know, isn't completely solid. It's not 100% ice, there's air bubbles in it. And that's important if you wanna understand how past climates were. And so the difference between fern and glacial ice is one of the big ones is those air bubbles were actually seal off. And so there's a response from the atmosphere until, or with those bubbles until they seal off and then they become little time capsules. And uh, places like Antarctica and Greenland have in phenomenal records because you can count uh, the annual layers of accumulation and melting all the way back to, in some cases, 800,000 years in Antarctica, and that's pretty phenomenal. So you can see here, oh, it's a little off here, but this is the melting line. So you get a little dark band because uh, snow has to nucleate on dust in the atmosphere. And so you probably washed your, or kind of gone out to your car after it rains or after snow melts on it, and you'll see that there's dust on your car. And that's the same principle because you have to have something to, to start to aggregate those uh, particles in the atmosphere. And so when you melt that snow, you then will get a concentration of those dust particles. And you can actually trace uh, the chemistry of that too and get information on climactic records in these ice cores as well. However, I do my work in Iowa, all the glaciers are gone. I'm not <laughs> too interested in ice cores because there's, there's none. <laughs> I would love to go to Antarctica and collect some, but for our studies, we have to use a more terrestrial base. So there's no, the reason there's no glaciers is because of this diagram. And ooh, it's a little, little blurry, but the point of it is there is a balance between accumulation and uh, ablation. So that is the equilibrium line and glaciers remove from where it accumulates to where it melts. And they have to melt because there's no, there's not glaciers covering the entire world. And that's important because there might have been times in, in, in Earth's history where the climate was so that everything was covered. But now we, we sit on this, this threshold where it's glaciated and not, and glaciated and not. And so that's an important thing uh, to understand that we sit on this little, little like not a knife's edge, but you know, there, okay, it's a pun because an arete is a glacial carved mountain. It's French for knife edge. Anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, on a tangent here. 
But the important thing to note is that this equilibrium line represents where ice will, if, if ice advances or retreats, it's based on if, it, if there's accumulation or more ablation. And so as ice sheets retreat, there's more melting, and as they grow, there's more accumulation. So how do these ice sheets move? Well, this is an important thing to keep in mind because this is a really interesting field. And I, I, uh, Minnesota is great because it has both of these examples uh, in, 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 in the bed forms. So we mentioned internal deformation. That's just the ice moving due to its own mass. And then the other way glaciers can move as if they slide along the base. And really cold based glaciers are frozen to the bed. So the only way they move is if the ice flows itself. However, if there's a different substrate or it's a little warmer, you'll get layers of water underneath the ice and that will allow the ice to move. And so uh, will allow, allow it to slip along the bed. So the glaciers that have that going on move much more quickly and thus interact with their beds in different ways. And if we think about how ice moves, you know, it's like kind of a stream. So you'll have areas uh, like this in this alpine glacier where it'll be rooted to and frozen to the beds which move up the, the mountain uh, uh, mountains themselves. And the quickest uh, with the most velocity will be in the middle because that's where most of the flow is going because it's not uh, grounded on, this, on the side. So there's not that friction holding them in place. So you get more movement in the center. And that's why you get these curves in, uh, uh, in, in the grasses and things like that. And so another thing too that uh, I think is kind of a misconception that people have is that glaciers are bulldozers. They, they push sediment in front of them as they go down. And that's not exactly true. They're actually more conveyor belts than bulldozers because as ice advances, particles are suspended up into the ice from uh, further afield. So if you come to Iowa, you'll find rocks from Canada, you know, from parts of Minnesota as well, but it's not like it was pushed in front of the ice, it was actually up into it. And so as the ice advances, it also melts at the snout, but each year that particle will move closer and closer to the edge, and then eventually it will melt out. And so moraines and things like that aren't necessarily because there's push, there's also a conveyance due to uh, the ice actually flowing itself. And so there's two main there's two main regimes. You know, it's not binary, but there's zones of erosion and zones of deposition. And the further you are a field from the ice dome itself, where it accumulates, the more deposition you'll have. So in areas like Canada and parts of Minnesota the ice is gonna be much thicker, you're gonna have a lot of erosion and you're not gonna get as much till accumulation. So parts like uh, the Canadian Shield, there's a lot of granites and igneous rocks right at the surface there. So those metamorphic old billion year old, two billion year old cratonic rocks are right at the surface because that's where the ice was eroding mainly. Whereas in Iowa and parts of Southern Minnesota, you're further afield, so you get into the depositional regime. And there are parts of Minnesota and Iowa that have over 800 feet of glacial till. Accumulated, of course, over multiple iterations, but still, that's a lot of, uh, of topography change, especially in uh, the mid-continent. And so the way that ice likes to erode things is it'll erode right over the surface, and then it'll put water down into cracks due to pressure melting. So you have a little hump the ice will compress, it'll melt a little bit, and then that will go down into the crack, freeze. And like I found out last winter when I forgot to un, uh, when I forgot to uh, un, unscrew my hose from my side of my house in the winter time, the pipe froze and burst because ice expands when it freezes. Uh, so it'll do that to rock and ice is incredibly strong and you can just shear all kinds of rocks off of the face. And so then you'll get a lee side that's rough and a soft side that is smooth. And you'll find these features in Wisconsin and parts of Minnesota too. And how ice gets up into the ice or how material gets up into the ice is due to these crevasses. So as you move the glacier, it's not a uniform blob, it's, it's brittle, it's, it's ice. 
So it'll break and then you'll have fault lines as the ice flows and then you can get material actually up into it. And that's important because it's like a giant sponge, you know, it will move material up and then as it melts and melts it out, uh, carrying it down, uh, down slope here. And so here's a shot of this Alpine glacier and you can see these uh, curvilinear shapes and that's because of that flow regime again. It moves quicker in the center. And you can also see where these ice, two ice streams are coming together, giving you this uh, debris rich center here. And that is a lateral moraine between these two. So this is actually not a glacier because it's not advancing. This is retreating. This is now an ice shelf. So keep, the, keep in mind that, you know, we're losing these glaciers so fast that they're not gla glaciers anymore. They're just, uh, they're just ice fields. And so get out there and see them while you can. So this is what it could look like you know, after an ice sheet retreats. However, if this was in place in front of an ice sheet, what would happen is it would act like a sanding block coming down with all that sediment that's carried up into uh, the ice. And those would act like tools and it would smooth them out. And so here you can see in Peru, these grooves are from the base of the ice sheet. And so sandpaper is a great analogy because you have ice holding these sharp rocks, uh, sharp and hard, and then as it moves, there's a lot of pressure on it and it'll just carve the landscape underneath it. And so here you can see a shot of some basalt from Iceland with glacial striations over it. And I think that's pretty cool. So, you know, I'll just, spice in some nice shots of glaciers as we go because man they're just gorgeous so here's another alpine one here's a beautiful shot again from iceland and you can see how this ice sheet is spreading out this this glacier here so as it goes into an area that isn't confined anymore it'll spread out because it's a viscous it's not quite solid, it's not quite liquid, it's right there in between. Here's another shot of two coming together. And then this is one of my favorites. Okay, okay, well, that's enough. Let's get to the actual reason that I'm studying ice in the mid-continent. And that's because of things like this. This is Antarctica. This is, this is um, usually I tell a really bad joke about like really angry uh, female Catholic, it's, this is called a nun attack. It's, it, it, it would have been a bad joke. I, I, I should just get over it and uh, I should fire my writer. But anyway, the point of this is continental scale glaciation doesn't obey topography. There's so much ice. It sits around for so long that it can grow so thick that mountain ranges are underneath parts of this ice sheet. So word of this Antarctic ice sheet to melt, this probably is sitting 5,000 meters above the base. And here's another shot. And so this is a continental glacier. And Antarctica has been around for maybe 30 to 40 million years. And so it's only over the last 2.6 that North America has really uh, come into its own. And that's due to a bunch of different factors, but mainly you to the closure of the Isthmus of Panama, reorganizing the uh, uh, ocean currents. So one thing we should talk about before we get into uh, a lot of different, uh, or before we get into it, we have to talk about ice domes. And in Canada is where this, these ice domes form for the North American ice sheet, the Laurentide ice sheet. And so one of the things uh, to keep in mind then is, well, these domes can shift due to different factors. Like if you have an area where ice is not sliding over the bed bedrock, it's just hanging out and sitting there, well, then your ice will grow thicker. And if it gets to a zone where it is like entering the ocean or Hudson Bay, that will thin out. And so you can have this shifting ice dome. And then if you factor in also precipitation, because you can have the ice dome actually interacting with climate to determine where you're going to get snow and, and uh, precipitation from. So over Canada, there's two general ice domes 
uh, that would affect us, the Kiwaitan to the west and the Labrador to the east. And as they grow, they interact and sometimes uh, influence each other. Usually this area is completely covered by ice when uh, things are really ri ripping and rolling, but now they're gone. So we have to infer where they've been due to uh, uh, the different sediment because rocks from this area and rocks from this area are different. So another way, or that, that's, that's the point of, of a stratigrapher is understanding how things are and when they happened. So in Iowa, this is what our till looks like. It's gray, it's really clay rich, and there's not a lot of gravels and sands in it compared to tills like in uh, parts of Wisconsin and northeastern Minnesota. And so there's actually two tills here. There's this one on top and then this one below. And this is where the second ice sheet came down and stripped off all of the landscape around, leaving a basically <laughs> unidentifiable uh, contact between them uh, unless you were out in a quarry. So if you saw this in core, you'd cry uh, pretty hard. So erratics are another way to determine where ice came from besides just looking at the tills. And so erratics have been studied since the beginning of glaciation. And this is uh, a shot of my grandmother going to school here in her little buggy. No, I'm kidding. This is from uh, the Calvin collection, which is, he's an old geologist, was an old geologist at, at the University of Iowa. And they have these phenomenal pictures of all of these glacial erratics that are now destroyed because, you know, this is someone's field, they want to farm it. So they dynamite these old boulders. But the thing is, these are great indicators of the general provenance of the ice sheet. So there's a lot of uh, material from the St. Cloud granites in Minnesota. So ice had to travel over those to pick those up. And another way to indi indicate where uh, ice has been and is coming from is to look at the moraines. And so we talked about moraine formation, you know, it's not quite bulldozing it down. As the material moves, or as the ice, ice advances and melts, so where that it's at equilibrium of uh, advancing and ablating, you'll get moraine formation. And so the thing about that though is moraines show, signify the edge of an ice sheet. So the furthest uh, moraine out is the terminal. And then as you retreat, you'll get recessional moraines. And other glacial features that you can see are drumlins, eskers, kettles, uh, you know, outwash plains. Uh, and, and these vary depending on where you are, if you're closer to the erosional regime or depositional. So you don't get big outwash fans near drumlins because the ice was much further afield when it started to melt, pumping out all that water. And so if we look at Iowa, we can really see some of these features quite distinctly. So this is, uh, this, this dotted line is the edge of the last glacial advance. And in this state, you can really see the moraines. You can see how strongly these uh, uh, different features are. And there's all kinds of little small ones here and this moraine right here, this moraine right here is the Algona, and that sits about 100 feet above the landscape around it. And that landscape is super flat because it's new. And so this is a good indication that this ice flowed in from the north because like we talked about before, as ice flows, it will flow quicker, farther down the center axis because that's where the most mass is. That's where you're going to get your flow direction. So besides just looking at where ice came from, we wanted to determine how many ice advances there were. And there's evidence for multiple tills. And you can see that based on disk conformities. And this is the same shot. This is the same quarry that I showed earlier with those two people standing in front of that gray till. This is just angle 90 degrees. And this is how I knew there was two uh, till advances because this is a disconformity which was sitting at the surface of the landscape. So this till, you know, was laid out down under ice. It was in an anoxic environment. There's no way that air is going to get down 
and, and, and interfere with the deposition as, as that ice sheet advances. So what happens is you have these iron minerals laid down and as the uh, are exposed to the atmosphere over time, and it takes thousands of years for this to happen, you'll get the uh, weathering of these, of these and oxidation of different states of, of iron. And so it turns from gray to orange. And then if you were to see this before the ice advance, there'd be a soil on it. And Iowa has numerous paleosols that can be used to track uh, the ages of these uh, till of, or these ice sheet advances too. And so when we look at core, we can see the difference between these uh, uh, di different advances by the intensity of this weathering. So this is a really old uh, core and you can see secondary accumulations of carbonate. There's sometimes barite and anhydrite because it was a different climate when that soil was formed. We don't see those uh, uh, processes happen because there's, uh, it's not a, as intense of climate. It's more mild, more temperate, we have more water and there'd be a higher water table today than in this period. And we can kind of see that based on this uh, till that was laid down 30,000 years ago and does not show this intense weathering. And so one of the things that is really important in Iowa is outwash. And that's because Iowa is, so, is, is, is super drained, unlike uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. That's because it's an old landscape. So we have all of these drainages that were touching the uh, snout of the Des Moines lobe. And as that ice sheet melted, both as it advanced and as it sat there and retreated, ice is always melting because it's so far south that even in the summer times, it's gonna be you know, highs in the 50s or 60s and that's gonna melt ice. Well, that ice, as we said earlier, is dirty. It has all kinds of stuff up in it and that will then create outwash plains. And so rivers that drain to the Des Moines lobe probably look something like this. And as I just said, you know, we have the highs and lows today but based on final records, uh, they were actually about 12 degrees cooler. And this is actually, I forgot to convert this to 12 degrees centigrade cooler. So, you know, you still probably have to wear your sweater in the summer times if you were, were around 20,000 years ago. So what this does, what this outwash does is it provides material for Aeolian process to occur. And this outwash provides both silt and sand that can blow across the landscape. And so just for comparison, if you think about a, si a grain of sand, you can see that with your naked eye, but silt is much, much finer, it's dust. You know, think about it like flour. And then clay is super small and will just blow away up into the atmosphere. So dust, this loss will settle out across the landscape. And that is one of the reasons why Iowa has a lot of uh, decent farmland across most of the state is because we have this, this windblown silt, this, this rejuvenation of nutrients that plants like, and it also drains uh, quite well too. So what it does then is accentuates old topography by having thick loss accumulation. So the Lust Hills in Western Iowa, they weren't hills that were much taller than the area around it, but they accumulated so much lust that it uh, really influenced the landscape and put them up, you know, uh, dozens of, of meters higher than the surrounding landscape. All right, so that's the basic rundown of the quaternary, how things are going. Uh, so to summarize what we're looking at there, and this is only part one, so just buckle up. Uh, glaciers need snow and not to melt to form. The glacial sediment is called till, and then windblown material is called less. So I'm going to just go quickly into the history of glacial studies in, in Iowa. So Louis Agassiz is a pretty famous geologist, and he actually visited Iowa City in 1864, and the town of Coralville is named in his honor because he was into Devonian fossils. So he was one of the big uh, promoters of this theory of continental glaciation. Uh, that was more extensive previously. So there was, you know, glaciers were recognized before uh, some of his and other colleagues put forth this idea, but not to the scale that we understand now. 
the first mention of glacial sediments in this area was by D.D. Owens in 1848. So, you know, this is before the Civil War. And they thought that these er or this area was uh, covered by water and that these erratics, these giant boulders that are sitting around, were drifted by icebergs from the north. And so that's where we get this term glacial drift. It annoys me because that's not how it forms. It forms under ice sheets, not from settling uh, uh, material from icebergs because, you know, the last time that Iowa was underwater, probably like from a marine setting might have been, well, the Cretaceous in the West. And anyway, I call it glacial till, but, you know, some people still call it drift. And then we had to establish that there was more than one. And so once again, I mentioned these paleosols and were then in 1868 after the Civil War was able to show that there are contacts between two till sheets. And here we can kind of see that roughly, and here's that former uh, picture that I showed. And so this disconformity means that there was two advances. There's two tills, two deposits, two ice sheets. And again, I show, I mentioned uh, the intensity of the weathering can indicate how long it's been sitting there. So if you have two uh, disconformities and paleosols associated with them, the thicker the weathering profile, the longer it was it sat before the next glacier came in. And so this is what it would look like uh, it, across most of Iowa. You have a little bit of loss more forming the soil, and then you get into weathered till and then unweathered till, so that battleship gray. Well, there's other interesting things too that kind of tell a strange story. There's these paha that form in uh, parts of eastern Iowa, and they're aligned hills that are elongated swells of soft and graceful contours standing apart on the plain or else connected with its fellows, sometimes in long lines, again in congeries, and locally merging to form broad plateaus. You know, uh, I can't write like that in scientific papers, but boy, it sounds pretty good. So what they're getting at is there's these hills that are oriented in parts of Iowa, and this is what it looks like in the modern topography. So this is a paha, and it stands about, uh, you know, 40 feet proud of the landscape, and this area is pretty flat. And based on that, they th thought that this area that formed it was a very unique uh, area that was uh, glaciated in a different time setting than the uh, more modern or the, the last glacial advance at the time. So based on that, they started giving names. And this is T.C. Chamberlain. Uh, I'm trying to grow my beard out to be as, as long, but I like eating soup too much. And so uh, as Nietzsche said, once you label me, you negate me or something like that. And so he determined that this area in central Iowa was the East Wisconsin. That's very obvious. There's moraines, it's flat, poor, poorly drained. It was basically all marsh uh, when Iowa was first settled. And then based on those paha, he gave this area the East Iowan uh, designation because it didn't look as new as this Wisconsin, but it looked older than the Kansan, which is the area all around. And so people kept naming new till plains as researchers went uh, further to the west. And so eventually in 1896, uh, they finally found the Illinoisan boundary and called it the Illinoisan advance. So that took three years to name all those different things. So about in 18, late 18th or late 19th century, this is how things stood. You have the Iowan, Wisconsin, Kansan, Illinois, and, and then the Nebraskan is beneath that Kansan. Well, the problem is this, this Iowan advance looks pretty bizarre because it has these tendrils of flatter areas that come off of it like little ice lobes. So they thought, and those interact with the Pajas and the same orientation. You know, you know, Leverett in Illinois didn't really think that those made a lot of sense. And if you look at them, you know, this is another shot of those paha. Well, they thought that these paha actually are areas where you have lust in a really old soil. 
and then on or between them, that soil has gone. So what they thought was that ice flowed in around them. So this is kind of what they were looking at. You have this loss covering with this older Kansan and then this younger Iowan till draped around it. It doesn't make a lot of sense and it's hard to explain because it's not how things were. So what they were supposing is that ice flowed around them and only preferentially eroded uh, these areas. So kind of like drumlins, but not because the drumlins are made of the bed materials. It's, it's, all, it's all kind of an interesting uh, question here. So uh, I just kind of answered that drum, drumlin question here. So yeah, they're not drumlins because they're not made of the same materials. It's material that was there beforehand and not made of sand and gravel or till. So it's, it's, it's a very strange thing. All right. And they're about 50 feet above the surface. Uh, let's skip through here. All right. So in Western Iowa, they named things kind of similarly. You can see there's all kinds of uh, breakdowns. And then in the 1950s, when Robert Rui coined the term Taswell and kind of got rid of a lot of different things. So this is where it stood at the, uh, in 1950. So you basically have Wisconsin, Iowan, Kansan, Nebraskan underneath it, and then the Illinoisan. Well, Robert Rui, I just mentioned, didn't really like this Iowan advance because of, again, of those aforementioned lobes coming off. And the Paha played an important role too. So what he actually showed was that this soil, this paleosol underneath the Lus, actually would have extended across the entire landscape, but it was eroded. So it looks something like this, where you have the original soil, and then there was a period of erosion that removed that soil. It wasn't a new glacial advance, it was some form of fluvial or paraglacial erosion. So Rui said, no, there's no Iowan. And then he got rid of that and gave us a Wisconsin aged uh, erosion surface, so not a till. All right, so after that, then we can actually start getting into the modern uh, story of using chronology to understand these ice advances because the Kansan and Nebraskan one is kind of tricky. So radiometric dating, you probably are familiar with this as are you know, both uranium and lead and then radiocarbon, which is important only up until about 40 to 50,000 years ago. So Des Moines lobe is great because it is young. It's 18,000 years at Des Moines so you can really get some great radiocarbon ages off of it. And the Illinoisan, you can see the boundary right here, and it's still fresh. So this is the flat state of Illinois. And so the Illinoisan came in and then retreated from the same direction. But what about the older advances? There's evidence in the marine record for multiple glaciations. So what's going on? Well, they, it, the marine record didn't, didn't match up with this Kansan Nebraskan model. And so uh, what happened was in Western Iowa, they were actually found ash layers. And these ash layers were thought to be, well, they found an ash layer that was called the Perlette ash. But in the 1970s, uh, Bolsdorf showed that it wasn't one ash layer, it was multiple. And these ashes came in from Yellowstone. And some of you might know that Yellowstone erupts about every 600,000 years, deposits ash that blows across most of the, uh, the Midwest, but doesn't get into Eastern Iowa, only the Western part. And so what you'd have is multiple ashes accumulating between till sheets. And what he used to differentiate these ash layers was uh, uh, fission track, uh, oh, sorry, uh, and fission track, yeah. Yeah, fission track uh, dating, which is a relative uh, way of looking at it. So if you have new biotite, it'd be clean, but as the uranium breaks down, it shoots off particles and then you get tracks. And these tracks aren't you know, necessarily equal to time, but these, these, these radioactive materials decay at basically the same rate. So as you have a mineral sit around longer, it'll get more and more tracks. So if you have three ashes that have very different rates of fission 
tracks in their biotype, you can get different chronologies. So for instance, you have this one that has a couple and then one that has um, more. So it's a relative aging method. In the field though, it's really complicated because glaciers love to erode the material beneath them as they go along. So you can draw boundaries wherever you want. It's, that's why I don't deal in Western Iowa because it's, it's, it's so tricky. But anyway, what, Ru, or what Volstorp did was he tracked those back to Yellowstone and got the chronology from Argon, Argon dates. And so he was actually able to get the calendar or like the actual year. So like 600,000 or 800,000 or 1.2 million years ago to give us an actual series of, of, of uh, actual stratigraphy because people kept noticing in Western Iowa, well, hey, there's this Kansan till in Nebraska till, if there's two tills, that's great. But then they kept finding third, another till beneath them or a till beneath those. And so things started to really fall apart. However, the problem with this is it's really hard to identify these pre Illinois or these, these non-Kansan and non-Nebraskan tills because they look very similar. So what they did was they renamed it the Kansan and Nebraskan and just lumped them all together as pre illinoisan So there's six tills in that package and they fit, you know, before the Illinois advance, which was 130,000 years ago. And this is the rough uh, way that it's broken up uh, today. So instead of using exclusively ashes, they get at uh, the polarity because there was a reversal about 800,000 years ago, the Bruins Matiyama reversal. And so there's tills that have iron minerals that have a reverse pole uh, or re re their polarity is reversed compared to the day. And so the newest discovery though, uh, as mentioned in my biography, is there was actually an advance into Iowa between the Illinois and, and Wisconsin. And so you can see the moraines here, you can kind of see them, but it's really difficult. So what you have to do is go out and collect a bunch of cores, make some maps based on those cores, and then sh use all of this information of these cores to come up with a story to explain why there's those moraines up to the north. Luckily, we were able to date it. So if you go out to certain quarries, you can get wood and till, and then radiocarbon date that, which we did, showing that parts of this Iowan uh, surface actually were more recently glaciated, but it was also affected by that period of erosion. So things were reworked and, and really destroyed. And that's a really complicated story because there's a lot of uh, uh, paraglacial erosion and different processes going on. So that's pretty, pretty, <laughs> that's a whole other talk. What we can do is reconstruct where this sat. And so there was actually two advances of this uh, middle Wisconsin. So, you know, late Wisconsin is when the Des Moines lobe came in for the last time. Middle is before that. And then early, well, it was before that too. But the rough ages of there fall between, you know, 45 to 40 and another advance around 32,000 years ago. And so that's the rough stratigraphy. So if we throw that in to uh, the story of North or the story of Iowa, well, we have this boundary set forth. Uh, and then this is the, well, sorry, let me back up. So in context, this is the maximum extent. And this maximum extent is about anywhere from 500,000 to 2.6 million. It's hard to determine how these how far these older ice sheets came because they're so old that you can't find the moraines. And then you have the Illinoisan here, which is 160 to 180,000 years ago, uh, or 130,000 years, depends on, on what ages you use. And then this boundary here is formed 145 to 115,000 years ago. And that's the last iteration of the Laurentide ice sheet when we get most of the modern topography. And so you can see, uh, indications of this based on sliding patterns. So this is the roughly the same image we started with. And you can see how ice came in here, flowed down, and then broke on this prairie coteau. So if you have lobes coming down, and if you hit this really hard material up here, 
ice will, will behave and split off. And so what this does is sets up the landscape because there's glaciers are giant sheets of ice and they will push rivers around like they're small cricks and you have a bunch of material to plug them up with because they do. And so what you can get at then is look at how ice affects the landscape. And so this is what I'm working on now, uh, looking at how the formation of all these little moraines sets up the landscape to uh, have the orientation of the drainage networks. And so as ice comes in, you know, it has that curvilinear shape and as it retreats, it sets up those moraines in the same pattern. So the rivers then form either between these moraines or perpendicular to them as the uh, landscape forms and these uh, areas drain. So this also has to do with the formation of lakes behind moraines and bursting through. So it's a complicated story, but the pattern is generally uh, sound. And how it forms, you have uh, the original landscape, ice comes down, pushes the rivers and retreats forming moraines. And then these incipient streams later become larger rivers. So the thing is, all of the patterns in Iowa indicate that ice came from the north over the last few iterations of the Laurentide ice sheet. Besides the exception that proves the rule, the Illinoisan, and you can see the influence of that in that area by the reorganization of the drainage networks. So the question is, when did these flow paths establish? And he, this is based off the elevation of North America. Uh, so this is another thing too that uh, is 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 starting to really really come about is looking at how uh, ice has changed over the Quaternary based on the erosion of materials in Canada, and so part of the future is to figure out where all this ice came from and when it left. So we can use all these different proxies from uh, North America or the ice cores, uh, deep sea sediments to really understand this. But what we really need to do is start to think about how the bedrock of North America has existed. And this is, you know, a little bit out there, but this is uh, how I think things are. And, you know, I'm not uh, uh, beholden to stick to the, the uh, given interpretations if I think I have better ones, right? That's how being a professional is, especially, you know, professional quaternary geologists where it's <laughs> just all uh, fancy, fantasy and mysticism interpretations. But I think this makes sense. So what we're looking at is flow paths into Iowa. And so how that happens, if we think about the bed interaction with these ice sheets, well, if you have a soft bed that can deform, ice will preferentially flow quicker around that, draining the ice sheet in that direction. And if we think about soft sediments, well, wouldn't a shallow marine uh, lithologies really provide a more deformable bed than the craton? And shouldn't this Western interior seaway wrap around and guide ice down into Iowa repeatedly? And before that Western interior seaway, or before the ice came, well, there's actually valid or evidence for Cenozoic uh, materials from the Rocky Mountains in Iowa. So on the other side of the M Missouri River, which was put in place by ice. So you have the Rockies growing in the Cretaceous and into the Cenozoic, shedding off materials to the West. Think of the Platte River, think of the Little Missouri, all of those would have just flowed perpendicular to the direction of the mountains until they didn't. And in this case, they didn't because they ran into an ice sheet. And if we also look at this area uh, north into Canada, Lake Man Manitoba and Saskatchewan, well, this shape here looks like it's a preferential flow path, just like the Great Lakes are. And so once you have ice coming into the mid-continent rift, which is softer uh, sediments laid down billions of years ago, or one point whatever billion, you have softer sandstone between harder mafic and volcanic rocks. 
So ice will flow into that and flow faster in that uh, rift, orienting the ice sheet. And so if you have that same pattern, but not, uh, but over the entire boundary between the igneous and metamorphic boundary, well, guess what? Then you can orient how the ice will flow and it will follow that boundary south into Iowa, through Minnesota, through Iowa into Kansas and Nebraska and Missouri in the earlier iterations. And so you might be thinking, well, you know, wait, did it really grind up that much rock? That is there really that much missing Cretaceous material in here? And the answer is yeah, because there's so much till. And so if we look at how much ground up rocks there are in Iowa, there's so much. And I doubt that there's one, I don't, I don't think the relationship between till and bedrock is one to one. So, you know, it's not like you take one cubic meter of bedrock and it'll give you, or grind it up in an ice sheet and it'll give you one cubic meter of till because you have outwash, you have all kinds of materials just flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. So there's probably like one or two or two to three to four times the amount of bedrock ground up to make the same volume of till. And so this is another interesting little tidbit too. The Missouri River was actually laid down entirely by ice. Like we were talking about with the Platte, see how it flows east to west gradually, lazily, languidly. I mean, you could ride a, a covered wagon over this thing, it's so shallow because it's just had a long time to just wave in place. But the Missouri is different and it cuts across all these drainages too. And it matches with the boundary of the last glacial advance. So probably from this part of Nebraska north, this part of the Missouri is only 30 to 40,000 years old. But in this part on the western side of Iowa, it's likely half a million to a million years old. And you can see the difference in the size of the, of the channels. So if you were Lewis and Clark going out on your expedition, you know, trying to find the Northwest Passage, if, I always find comfort thinking, you know, what they didn't know is that if they looked on their left side as they're going up the Missouri River, it would, been, would have been generally unglaciated. And if they would have looked to their right, it would have been glaciated because the Missouri River is completely controlled by glacial ice. And why do I think that that is true? Well, because this area in Canada wasn't covered by ice until very late. And so you can't have uh, ice over areas that have charcoal from fires. And there's multiple dates in here showing that it was ice free during the buildup to the last glacial maximum. So ice was coming into Iowa from that boundary that it slipped on, you know, between the Craton and the softer sed rocks coming down into Iowa. And eventually ice grew up from the East pushed it up over that uh, that boundary and then flowed, giving us the Missouri River. And the Lust record likely shows that. And anyway, I'm getting far, like I'm starting to pull at thread, so I better sum it up. So thank you. Uh, I'll take questions if you have them. Uh, feel free to ask anything. I'm around all night. I've got nothing better to do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Um, there were, I think there are a few questions. Let me and feel free to enter more questions. Uh, I got to find them here now. Let's see, I got to move things around on my screen. Looks like Gary Dukes asked uh, if there was a braided river. And the answer to, uh, to his question is there's not braided rivers in Iowa now because how rivers form in, in uh, the Midwest now isn't by massive uh, discharge from ice sheets. So we don't get uh, like in mountain ranges, the same thing happens with the spring thaw. So you get this big pulse of water, it sends out all the sediment, and then the rest of the year, there's smaller volumes of water, which then don't, they don't have the energy to move the sands and gravels. And so that's where you get that braided river, you get big floods, and then like low flow. In, in the Midwest now, we get more base flow, so recharge from the, the bed of the river. And so that gives us just a lot of just uh, uh, steady flow. And so that's how we get these meanders now 
because it's a environment with less uh, energy in it. And uh, does Dave want me to get into Paha because they're a lot, there's a lot of, <laughs> Uh, sure. A lot of that. <laughs> I'm just going to comment on uh, on your last picture there. I'm looking at it. Uh, you do have a long way to go with your beard, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I. The thing is, I already have like long hair. It's you know to my shoulders, and I, it, I, I feel like it's one or the other. And I, I, again, I like eating too much, and I don't like pulling it out of my beard. So I don't know how those old timers did it. <laughs> Sure. I mean, you described uh, pawhaws and uh, and you did mention they're different than drumlins, but uh, um, if uh, you have more clarification, uh, great. I'm yeah, sure I do. When, so when Dave entered that uh, question. Yeah. So I I kind of like being a geologist from a small state. Well, not a small state, but a small state survey. I have multiple hats or helmets, if you want to if you want to say that. Uh, and one of them is trying to understand what's going on in the eastern half of the state. And so this is that Iowan glacial advance, but in reality, it's an erosion surface because this area was covered in permafrost uh, as that last ice sheet advance. So it was super cold. There was ice forming in the ground and then the landscape warmed up and destabilized. And so that's what removed that soil is, is, is uh, basically giant slush flows, giant uh, massive scarp formation uh, coming from these rivers that carried outwash. So what that did was level, leveled out the landscape, which then allowed that dust to, well, disallowed the dust to accumulate because the sand was able to be transported out of the system. So if I pull up, I think I have, yep. I'll pull up another PowerPoint and just go through that real quick. Uh, let me find it, not give it away. Yeah, so here we go. So these Paha form where areas are, where, where, the, where the dust can accumulate. And so where that is, is where there's either a, or there's an upwind impediment to the sand because the sand just gets out and basically deflates the landscape around it. So, I mean, saltation, the sand balances, it has energy and, and it deflates. But if there's like say a bedrock uh, line valley, the sand will hit that bedrock and fall in. And then the dust that was blowing across the landscape will then be able to accumulate. And so we see that if we look at zones in Iowa, uh, let's see it here. Yeah, so we have orientations of the landscape. Oh, dang it, where did that go? Um, yeah, right here. So these Paha form because there's bedrock lining in lining this valley and then the less accumulates downwind. And that's why they're oriented, not because of ice flow, like a drumlin, but because of during the quaternary or during the, the, the last glacial maximum, winds from the northwest were super strong and super dominant. And so it aligned the entire landscape. If we actually look at Iowa, I mean, it's pretty striking that the entire landscape has this strong pattern. And that's because rivers like the Cedar right here carried massive amounts of outwash. So you can see here how wide that is. It's about two miles. And it just carried all kinds of sands that were able to just flow across the landscape. But like this right here, I know for a fact that this is uh, lined by bedrock. This is an area where I mapped. And so there's 80 feet of less here because it sits right next to the source and the sand can't get out because there's that bedrock wall. And that occurs again and again. Here's another paha. Here's another paha. So here's a pod of them, if you want to call them that. And the thing is, they are not controlled by uh, fluvial drainage because they cut across watersheds. So you're not going to be able to say, well, it's due to fluvial erosion cutting back the landscape. 
if they're not oriented with the watersheds themselves. They're oriented with the wind. So they're controlled by eolian processes. All right, let's see what else we got. Okay, Mike's asking in the Des Moines Lobe area, the topography is affected by more streams than in Minnesota generally. How do you explain this? So uh, that's something I'm working on too, is showing the ages of the section. And so one of the things too to, to think about is the amount of time as, or the, the distance water has to go to reach its base level. And in Iowa's case, it's the Missouri or Mississippi. And now on the Des Moines Lobe here, it's predominantly the Mississippi. So this area has been around, has existed as a surface for about 18,000 years as the ice retreated. So 18 to 16. But the thing is, it's not that well developed. So a lot of these drainages were in, enhanced by human uh, channelization. But this Des Moines River is the area that's really carved down. And that's because it was a giant event that flooded the area and just really tore down into uh, the area because to the south of it, this was much lower. So you had a nick point that traveled all the way up the uh, Des Moines lobe until it kind of basically petered out north uh, into Minnesota. And so if we look at parts of Minnesota, oh, hold on, let me bring up another file. So if you look at parts of Minnesota, uh, the Des Moines lobe was even more recent, so, or have, has left that area even more recently. So you wouldn't have the landscape development just due to time too. But uh, there's also the influence of Glacial Lake Agassiz, and you're not closer to the lower parts of the Mississippi, which would control base level and incision. So it's this kind of multiple avenue thing of, uh, yeah, here we go, of its uh, newer landscape in Minnesota by a couple thousand years. And it's also closer to the headwaters of the Mississippi. So there's not as much energy available because it's at a lower or higher elevation and you aren't gonna get that base level nick point cutting back. All right, so uh, Pete asks if uh, never visited central Iowa as a terminal moraine substantial. Well, actually, that's a great question because uh, the state capital of Iowa is actually on the Des Moines, uh, or the uh, Bemis moraine. So yeah, you can see it here in all its grandeur, and it sits high above the rest of downtown uh, uh, Des Moines because it's on moraine. Let's check that out real quick. Oh, there's Tasty Tacos. Okay, satellite imagery. So yeah, here's the here's the state house, and then if we zoom out, there is the Bemis Moraine right there, and so it sits high atop that. It's in Des Moines, you can't really see it too well because it's, uh, you know, been uh, covered by houses and stuff. But it is pretty significant. If we look at it on the hillshade here, you can still see that there's a moraine, but it's not as pronounced as the Algona in north central Iowa. And so this one here is pretty substantial. And I said it's about 100 feet above the lands. Uh, the rest of the area in some places. So it really depends on uh, how long the glacier was sitting there and how much material it was pushing up and things like that. Uh, so there's a question about clean ice, free of dirt and rocks may flow plastically when ice thicknesses are 90 feet or greater. When ice has lots of air in it, is there any, is there any plastic flow observed? Uh, I'm not a ice physicist, so I can't answer that question, but I know estimates are, would say that the reconstruction, reconstructed ice sheets are much thicker because they're not clean at all. They're really dirty. And so you have all kinds of particles in them. And I think uh, Neil Iverson at Iowa State put 
the Des Moines lobe may be at about a thousand feet thick. Let me check that real quick. Yeah, I think it's about somewhere in there from anywhere to 600 to 1,000 feet. And you have to keep in mind, too, that uh, the ice was connected up to the ice sheet. So it was thicker as you got closer to the dome. Uh, so yeah, I, I'd say it's somewhere from 600 to 1,000 feet. Uh, the Des Moines lobe was that thick. All right, let's see if there's any more questions here. OK, we do have a couple people that are phone on only. Um, uh, phone number ending with 6271, I'm going to allow you to talk. If you have anything to say. Oh, it right. looks like. Well, it looks like they're muted still. And, and then there's also. Uh, there Hello. Go. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I didn't have any questions, but I certainly uh, I certainly enjoyed the talk. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, and now uh, um, eight six three one. Uh, you should be able to unmute. Uh, hi, it's Mary Helen. Um, one question I've been attempting to follow with my atlas, which includes elevations, because I can't see your slides. Oh yeah. Uh, Am I, I'm looking at a map of Iowa and seeing that the southeastern quarter roughly uh, is much lower elevation than the other three quarters, um, and obviously due to the drainage from the rivers. Uh, does that also represent roughly where the lowest lobe of the ice was? So that is a very insightful and very complicated question because <laughs> what's going on in this part of the Midwest is you have the influence of tectonic forces setting the stage for quaternary ice advances. So mm -hmm. what I mean by that is you have the, in, we're, we sit between the Appalachian Mountains or Appalachians and the Rockies. And so right. we have influence from both of those over different time intervals. So clearly since, you know, the rise of the Rockies, they've been the dominant force. However, there is some influence from the East because of drainages off of them. And so that's an important question of when do these drainage networks establish? Some people actually put the Mississippi uh, to be way older than uh, I would give it credit for, because what they, they say is that all of North America drained down the Mississippi uh, before the ice sheet started. And that would put, uh, I just don't believe that. So what, what I'm getting at though is the uh, elevation that you're talking about is due to a couple of different things. Likely the bedrock is lower there because of you know, all of the sediment from the Rocky Mountains shedding off coming mm -hmm. across uh, from the west, and that would add uh, hundreds of meters of elevation. And then as material gets eroded due to ice, it will act like a shield to block some of the erosion uh, that other areas would experience. So you'd still get uh, higher elevations to the west due to Cretaceous. And Iowa has uh, a couple hundred feet of, of Cretaceous sediment in the west. So ice flows from there to the southeast because it's at a lower elevation and ice flows like water downhill, uh, or I should say, you know, to its gravitationally sound uh, position. So yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. South East Iowa is lower, but it's an interesting place because it's shaped like that due to ice that came in from Illinois probably one or two times. And we can see that if we look at the orientation of these drainage networks. And so- Yeah, they're all I facing this... the Mississippi. And if the Mississippi wasn't there, they'd be facing Illinois. Yeah, yeah. So there's this interesting interplay between rivers that look like they come from the Northeast or Northwest to Southeast that dip mm -hmm. into the Mississippi. But the Mississippi itself was put in place by ice multiple times. Right. The modern channel uh, today 
from the Quad Cities down to St. Louis is only 20,000 years old. It used to flow from uh, Dubuque to Peoria, and you can see the size difference of the streams, mm. and it reflects that. So what happened was um, the Lake Michigan lobe about 25, 26,000 years ago blocked that Mississippi River, formed Glacial Lake Milan until that was large mm -hmm. enough to punch through the area near Rock Island, uh, Illinois, and then the Mississippi flowed into the uh, what would have been the Iowa and the Cedar uh, River system to St. Louis. But before that, you know, ice pushed the Mississippi around multiple times uh, as well. And so there's actually evidence that the Mississippi River would have flown, flowed north through uh, the Wisconsin River Valley. Uh, Eric Carson of the Wisconsin Survey has showed that. And I, sorry, you can't see the slides, but the Wisconsin River is pretty interesting because it looks like it would have flowed north up into uh, Hudson Bay through the Great Lakes potentially because the angle of the rivers coming into it are backwards now. So you'd expect okay. rivers to come in at V's to the trunk, but because yeah. of the reversal of the flow, they're facing the wrong way. So what I'm getting at is ice has pushed around all, all these rivers, uh, really changed the entire landscape, how things drain. And then because of that, you get different erosion rates around the Midwest uh, due to a factor, like due to all these factors, which was originally set up by uh, what the bedrock was doing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, then there's one more, another question in the uh, Q&A box. Okay, let me try to find that. It's right. a problem with having so many uh, programs up. Or I can just read it. It says, do you have a picture of the Algona Moraine in North Central Iowa? Uh, I don't have a picture of it myself. It's like kind of underwhelming because the scale can't be captured by a uh, camera. But what I can do is show you here on the uh, ArcGIS. So this is like my main tool that I use. And so if we, actually, let me open up another one if I can. Uh, but basically the elevation is pretty stark in this area. So it's really flat because it's a new surface, but that Algona Moraine sat around for a while. Uh, actually, let me, open up another one and I can just read the elevation values from it. This is this is this is cutting edge science. This is what how cutting edge science works. You just sit around, wait for some guy to find a file so you can read elevation values from it. <laughs> <laughs> or it could crash too. Uh, you know, it depends. Let's hope not. Yeah, that that made it crash. Cool. So anyway, oh Oh, that's what I was doing. Here we go. Okay, so I don't have it. Yeah, give me a, a second here. I'll I'll fire it up in 3D so you can see the elevation differences in that way. If that if that works for everyone. Um, So in the meantime, here's the three D map of North America. And so this is the modern surface uh, with the bedrock transposed on it. And you can really see these flow paths into Iowa. So, you know, here's Iowa glacial boundary, but there's a stark difference in how in, in this area, because ice has really carved that out. And the same thing is with the Great Lakes you have ice coming into this great lake, it's Lake Superior, and it would just float around and then come out due to the orientation of that mid-continent rift. And so not to spoil Andy's talk, but most of the Great Lakes were caused by soft spots in, in the bedrock. So Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, uh, I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but there's something going on and it has to do with the shape of Michigan. And it has to do with the Michigan Dome. So it's pretty neat to start to think about North America in that way. Okay, let's see here. Well, 
that's not working. Anyway, so yeah, it's about 100 feet high from the landscape around it, that Algona Marine. Okay, uh, Randy has a question he wants to ask, uh, and he can unmute himself, so I'll let him do that. Yeah, um, my question is, I've done the Ragbri bike ride across Iowa a number of times. I'm wondering if the survey would ever consider putting together a day-by-day uh, kind of a guide uh, for the ragbri riders of the geologic features they might be seeing. Well, Randy, funny you should ask because we did do that for about 20 years, but funding got cut from the DNR, uh, the Department of Natural Resources, so we didn't have a way to get those to the riders. Uh, the university had a mobile museum where they had to convert an RV to travel with the riders as well, but we also we actually have a lot of articles from across the state and we're working on uh, an interactive map of all those articles because as you've known, Rag Bride doesn't go on the same track. So uh, we do have it. It's just, we don't have uh, the staff now to update it every year. So if you send me an email, I can send you a link to uh, those, those PDFs. Okay, yeah, I'll do that, thanks. Uh -huh. Okay, I think we've answered all the questions, unless I want to check. I don't see any more here. Um, oh, Mary Kay Arthur raised a hand. Okay. Oh. Let me. Can I? Word. Hang on mute her so she can talk. There we go. There's a the chat. Okay. Yep. Well, thanks for having me here, Mary Kay. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I always call the land between two rivers. And it's great because those rivers were put in place by ice. So it should be the land controlled by glaciers, but it just doesn't ring off the, or roll off the tongue as easily. If you want to say anything, uh, Mary Kay, you can. You got to unmute. I guess not. She said what you want to do in chat, I guess. Um, David, Phil? David, oh, oh, Phil. I, I think it takes a long time for it to come up on my screen. Okay, go ahead, Mary Kay. Thank you. And thanks a lot for this talk. I'm the one who was the former Iowan, and I was born in Ames. Um, oh, Ames, Story County, yeah. Yeah, and I paddled. I'm a paddler, so I paddled little bits of lots of Iowa rivers. So mm -hmm. if I could have that link as well, I would be delighted. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, is it okay if I just send it to all our members? Yes, yeah. That would be good. Okay. When I send out the link to the recording, I assume you'll get this in a day or two, this link to us, right? Phil? Yeah. 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 When, when I, uh, I'll be sending out the link to the recording in a day or two. I will include that with uh, that email. Excellent. So Excellent. Bill, you can just do a reply all to the little conversation we've been having, um, you know, with Steve and Randy, and and, and then uh, I can pick it up from there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Phil, Phil, Steve Erickson here. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. I uh, always wanted to try to get other states, not just Minnesota, but want to have the adjacent states coming aboard, and, and uh, you did an excellent summary for us. So thank you very much. You're, you're welcome. I'm glad to let people know about the wonders of, <laughs> of Iowa because there's a lot going on and glaciers are really important and understanding how ice behaved in North America over the past two million years really explains, uh, well, actually I was saving something and I forgot to mention it. <laughs> so one of the most interesting things about uh, the glacial influence is in Minnesota, where are all the lakes? They're not in the West, are they? Mm -mm. They are in the Eastern part of the state. And why that is, is exclusively due to the advance of ice sheets. So uh, ice that came in from the West, much like uh, in Iowa, the Des Moines Lobe came in and it streamed in. So it was very quick, very, very, and it retreated rapidly too and it was thin, but ice that came in from Superior 
and, uh, and areas to the north was much thicker. And so when that ice sheet destabilized, it left giant chunks of ice that formed lakes. And so the reason that you don't have that in the west also is because of Glacial Lake Agassiz, because the drainage network was blocked by the ice sheet and it couldn't flow to the north anymore. So like the Great or the Red River to, of the north flowed right into the, the head of the ice sheet. And so you have this giant lake forming as the ice melts, disallowing the formation of glacial lakes that you get. And the ice also controls vegetation. So you have prairies on this flat clay rich till and then pine forests on this area of, of uh, to the east where there's more uh, iron rich and acidic. So you, you guys out, get, oh, go on, do, sorry. Do you guys get a lot of, do you guys get any agates down there that far south? Uh, yeah, we get them in outwash uh, piles. So uh, I wouldn't say that that's specifically from uh, ice that came from Superior, but you know, just based on chance, those agates are super hard. So you get reworked outwash from areas to the north, and then you can find them in, in, in piles in Iowa. All right. Thank you very much. Have yourself a good night. Thank Talk you. To you. I'm glad, glad to... Email you on it. Yes, Dave, thank you. Want you to take Phil. it then? And uh, everybody have a uh, well. First of all, um, we will have a lecture on February first, as you heard, and we'll get the information on the website uh, as soon as we can. Uh, we got plenty of time, obviously, because it's not for I think seven weeks from now. Um, but in the meantime, everybody have a great holiday. Have a uh, great new year, and hopefully 2021 will be a nicer year than 2020 has been. Um, <laughs> that's not a very high bar, but uh, let's hope for that. Um, and um, I guess, uh, and then uh, we look. I look forward to uh, Joe being president uh, next year. So good night, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.